somebody fell asleep in their pool. That's not what I bought it for. Hi, it's Dr. Jane Pendleton with my husband, Dr. John Pendleton, and we are back with Rambling Rogues. That's right, we're back. And today we have a lot of people asking us on a lot of our social media about any suggestions or tips for RVing. Since this is the season for fifth wheels, trailers, RVs, buses, tiny houses being moved from place to place and so a lot of people are giving their professional advice well I'd say since we've done this now for three months straight got some really good advice from people we've gotten um, we've never gotten any bad advice but we've gotten places where we didn't ask for advice and we had to learn some little tips and tricks on our own sorry the birds are I mean it's a beautiful 77 degree day today and after all the rain the birds are out We've got hummingbirds here at the feeder. We'll yes, and this is an outdoor adventure. So the birds and the sounds of the wildlife. We're going to start with some of our some of the things and the tips that we want to give you that we've learned along the way from from our maiden voyages and stuff. And there's always that maiden voyage, isn't it? Yes. What happened on our maiden voyage? Just quickly. Uh, the motorhome caught fire. Yeah, we caught fire. The that dripped onto the oil. Transmission oil dripped onto the muffler and it caught fire. Yep. And we found out that Progressive, no matter what's happened, even roadside service, even on this trip, we've had four flat tires in a week and a half. And we still have not once got Progressive to give us our roadside assistance, which they keep saying that we have. And we've still had to drive on tires and find our own service. So Progressive definitely out. That would be the number one thing I'd tell you not to get is Progressive insurance. Um, they advertise that they give you roadside service, but we've needed it four times now on all of our voyages and we have yet to receive the service or we received it and only one time did, where we, did they actually pay for it. Yeah. If they tell you to cut the check and they'll reimburse you, they'll close the case and never reimburse you. That's what we want to do. That's a real issue. Like my dad told me, insurance is only as good as it will pay. So um, the insurance companies and um, make sure you get an insurance company that you can actually get the product that they advertise and they advertise that if you're broke down they come out look at it take care of it and you don't have to do anything all right somebody told me to use travelers insurance so we're going to look that up so if you have more information on insurance that will cover rvs because usaa military insurance doesn't do it um matter of fact they're the ones that suggested progressive well we don't want an insurance that just keeps us on the road we want insurance that keeps us on the road. All right, so let's get started. First thing that you want to pack and is always sunscreen and hats, boots, raincoats for the kids. When we got that two-day downpour in Clifty Falls, I think the best thing that I saw was people all look like fishermen out there because you've got to be outside if you're in a fifth wheel or trailer, especially. You know, you got to drop your jacks. People are backing up and backing in and reparking their cars. You really need a good raincoat, rain hat, and umbrellas. Get the little compactable umbrellas. Kids love umbrellas. They loved playing with them. And um, it was fun to watch them. And they all had their boots and the rank. I think some of the kids changed their clothes five or six times that day. <laughs> so, a so, laundry. Oh, yeah. She said she probably. And you know, kids' clothes are small. Not like adult clothes, they're small. But I would bring at least six outfits a day for the kids, even if you're hanging them out and washing them yourself. Because we washed it, we saw it with our own eyes how many clothes they were using go through clothes. Uh, when it rained they were they were what were they jumping in the mud oh we all did too the closest mud puddle was the pond oh yeah oh yeah whatever pond they found <laughs> trust me all the roads it just had rained that much mm -hmm. but it's like everybody said after two days of pure rain it was worth it because the falls were at their peak and it was beautiful wasn't it yes it was beautiful never cross the falls this is my number two i'd say for me if they got a sign that tells you do not go past the thing do not get off the trail do not climb the rocks don't do it a boy last week at clifty falls died and the day that we were there a girl was doing um ballet she had obviously taken ballet and she was doing the parallels or whatever you call them, <laughs> pearl or whatever you call them and she was standing on one toe with her leg uh, kicked out you know how they balance themselves and kick their legs out and she was wanting people to take her portrait. Well, then she got really daring and crossed the rocks where you weren't supposed to go. Her family was just telling her she was crazy, but they weren't telling her not to do it. And, um, and of course, I was out there taking portraits of people. 
and doing a lot of family portraits that day and um and she kept crossing the rocks she went out to the same spot the boy died before the rains before the falls were running and he slipped and fell to his death on the falls and she was out there standing just on her toes doing ballet moves getting her portrait taken uh you know she was showing off so. 60 foot uh, drop when you get sucked down the falls so well especially when you're on your tippy toes yeah so john what would you in your medical professional opinion uh be about some of the experiences we had medically i think that would definitely rank up there in the in the top seat of preparedness well what you don't realize is the um the fallen world that we live in um there are a lot of insects that carry various diseases so to in some way protect your children and yourself from uh, the insect issue um, is really important. Uh, this is um, called Buggins. Yeah, he can't. He can't see those glasses. It's called Buggins Natural, and it's made with vanilla, mint, and uh, and rose oil. You can make this yourself, but it also has a carrier oil, and it smells nice. You just spritz this on. It doesn't hurt you. I put it on the dog. I put it on John around the neck, around the ears where ticks are going to be, in those, uh, your, you know, your armpit areas, back behind your legs, places where bugs are going to be, and um, it repels gnats and annoying flies. And it is plant-based, and it's 100% natural, and it is an insect repellent, and it's for ages one and up. I got this at Menards in the uh, camping section, and I keep several bottles on hand, and it really does work. And so far, I don't know how it works with ticks, but we only found one tick on us so far and i think i was at home when that when I, we found the tick that while we were at home i think so at our house yeah uh, there was a child that died at Raleigh hospital from a tick bite so encephalitis uh from uh, mosquitoes and other different uh, uh diseases that are born uh, uh, through um, insect bites are important uh, if you pre-treat your clothes with zo it has an agent in it that uh, that kind of repels insects. Citronella. So, yeah, citronella. So a uh, soap can be a, a good thing. Janie has a good formula for that soap, and if you pre-treat your clothes with uh, some sort of pre-treater uh, for uh, bug repellent, and you check your kids and make sure that uh, if they get flu-like symptoms, or uh, if you find them, you know, all bitten up with insects and things, or ticks on them might do the screening before it becomes an issue after the symptoms come a lot of times it's too late to do anything about it and uh and i think it's very important to pre-treat your clothes and wash your clothes with the citronella soap it has a nice scent um so many people are switching from the uh, fells mouth but to this and i think they're realizing that it's uh that citronella it's keeping the bugs and the insects and the mosquitoes away from you it automatically repels that now i'm not going to claim that repels ticks uh, but I do know one thing, Lexi doesn't have any ticks on her, and this is what I wash her with, a little bit of soap. Well, and there's other things you can do, like tuck your uh, pant legs and uh, treat around your belt areas and the open areas so that uh, where things would crawl into you or get to you, uh, mm -hmm. you'd have to kind of check one another for ticks and uh, insect bites and other different things. To dismiss uh, something as a cold, or some sort of um, a non-issue uh, uh, can lead uh, to death in children and adults or other different people of diseases that uh, that we could at least uh, get a handle on and prevent as much as we can. Now there's more toxic things that you could treat your clothes with. In the military we did some of the more toxic treatments to the clothes. But if you look at a military personnel, they tuck their boots they tuck their pants. They, tuck, they string them up really tight with the, with the boot chest. Definitely. And uh, the tucking your clothes and kind of keeping yourself contained uh, underneath the clothes kind of gives you an extra barrier, you know, with the insects and stuff, too. Yes, yes. Plus, plus military gave you bug netting, too. We gave a lot of that away. Yeah, it's um, bug netting can help a screen, you know, in reference to your, your camping environment. A lot of people we've seen put out tents. Uh, tell them what I woke up to last night. It was a tree cricket, it was green, uh, green bug. <laughs> I slept with it, and apparently when I closed my computer in my sleep, I would smashed it and was half alive and half dead in my computer. Yeah. I opened it up and I saw it on the screen and I went, what is this? And apparently I fell asleep at my computer. And, I, <laughs> and um, 
Alright, so, zo. What I like to do with the zo is I like to just take the bar like this right here. I'm not getting paid by zo. I love this stuff. And I just rub it on my pants legs, a little bit on my clothes, maybe a little bit in my hair, whatever. And I also use uh, essence oils like lemons and citrus essence, essence oil in my hair. After I wash my hair, I put a little bit of the straight up lemon essence oil. And um, I've kept, other than the tree cricket last night, and he was not on me. <laughs> so, but anyway, I've, so far I've kept things at bay. So I'm, I'm a big fan, you all know, of Zo, and that's just some more uses for it. And also, my other tip is to bring your laundry detergent and your homemade detergent with you with a scoop, with some clothespins and some clothesline. Right here, you can't see it, but we have our clothes hanging up here under the canopy, and this is, we've been able to do laundry. And I would say for the, um, for the time we've been out, um, I had this much, and we've been to the laundromat, all the clothes we've done for three, three, almost four weeks out, a month's worth, and I probably only filled the bag up maybe a third of the way, and I still have quite a bit left. Mm -hmm. So um, this just really goes far. You know, a tablespoon of this washes a large load of laundry, mm -hmm. and we've gotten dirty. Yes. We've gotten muddy and dirty, and uh, and it just has really helped keep everything really clean. I mean, look how clean I am. I feel clean. I feel and fresh. And while we're on the subject of laundry, I just wanted to show you. There's different types of clips and pins that you have. I have a big glass jar of them at home. Uh, you can get them, the old-fashioned wood kind and stuff. You can get them on um, on eBay, really, really cheap. People sell great big containers of them for like five, ten dollars. And so I've got a big glass jar of clothespins. And so I just put a few into this bag that I had a comforter come in. And it's got like a um, cloth bottom here that lets the, you know, to kind of let the water out. And this is what I store my laundry and my washables in, you know, my hand washables and stuff in here. And then they don't mildew because they've got an airflow on the bottom of this bag. It was just something that I, that I bought. I, and I've recycled it. It had a handle. It was perfect. And so I use that for my laundry bag. This way I'm not carrying around a great big mesh laundry bag, okay? Some people have like the little pop-up totes. Those are good if you have a lot of children and a lot of things, but it's just John and I. And I find that this right here works, okay? And things won't mildew. And then uh, while I'm hanging clothes up, it's also my clothespin holder. And I'll just use another clothespin. see this and I just clip it on like that right there okay favorite on the list would have to be pre-planning the meals like I do at home and doing the freezer foods uh, doing healthy freezer food meals like I do at home is we we're gonna be gone put a couple of extra meals in here because we ended up actually uh, these are the extra meals right here mm -hmm. because we actually ended up going to two more parks plus we came back here so we ended up being gone an extra week and a half just on the whim. So, um, so I was glad I had some extra food. Uh, this really cuts your food budget down, cuts the dishes down. Uh, our microwave in here is also a convection oven. So we were able to use the foil, not the top, but the foil part in the oven. Uh, some of you don't try it because you might not be able to do that. It depends on the type of oven that you have. And then what I do is I just thaw it put the dome on a plate and then I dump it on a plate and then arrange it nicely. This is just, I'll show you what this one is. This is our uh, asparagus, rice pilaf, and salmon that's been frozen. And that's just my portion. And it was absolutely delicious. We did Alfredo. We did spaghetti and meatballs. Um, I cooked for two days straight before we left. And, but I made enough dinners, lunches, and breakfasts for 10 days. Right. So what I like to do ahead of time as well is I figure out the number of days approximately that we're going to be gone. In this case, we thought we was only going to be gone 10 days. And I like to have gluten-free foods on hand for me. So I made gluten-free pancakes, those gluten-free confetti pancakes. I made those ahead of time. But I just got out the big uh, pancake uh, griddle and just started putting them on. And we still have quite a few left. Somehow I, I cut them back. So we started out with 27 pancakes, uh, figuring four per meal for the two of us. And then you just heat it one minute in the microwave and then another uh, few seconds on top of that. And then of course I brought my homemade blackberry syrup, which was delicious. But it took up two bags of these and then we stuffed these in the freezer in between, you know, the stacks of meals like this. 
But remember, my RV here has a full refrigerator. You might not have that. In that case, you're going to have to figure out a way to put these in Ziploc baggies and put these in ice or in like a cold water chest somehow. Or um, you can get a um, small freezer and um, and uh, carry it with you. So uh, the investment in a in a small freezer that's um, portable that works on um, uh, 110 when you plug in could be a very uh, good investment in reference to saving you money, time, and effort. Because some of the refrigerators are just little bitty things and you can't hardly get yeah. anything in them. Yeah, they're only meant for two or three days out. Something like this is a destination uh, vehicle. And you gotta take the main roads to get there. And once you get there and get all unpacked, you don't wanna be packing and unpacking and taking off and on all the lights and stuff. Trust me from us, it's, it's another tip. Uh, plan your vacation. Plan that you're going to be in one spot for at least three to ten days to make it really worth your while. And you'll want to bring a car, a car in tow. That way you can get around the park and around the town. Try to pick a location that is near a town that you want to visit. Here at Brown County, we made that our center location. And so from Brown County here, we can get to a whole bunch of other state parks and use Brown County as our center. That's why we've been here five, six times already this year and we've stayed here for so long mm -hmm. and uh, because I pre-plan on this being our little center because where we live there's not as many state I mean, there's no state parks really up where we live they're all right down through you know down through here so Brown County but every state park in Indiana since they came up with Prophetstown and Lafayette all I think it's 28 state parks and I think there's a uh, 15 wildlife and fish and wildlife uh, sections we're just hitting for the most part the state parks that doesn't include like Lake Monroe, Lake Lemon, or any of those, okay? None of those, or the RV parks that pe people privately own. We're talking just state parks. And so they're all an hour apart from each other. Most of them only 30 minutes. So you can hit two or three, four state parks in a week. Mm -hmm. But by the time you take all this gear up and down and everything, you don't want to just go and spend just one day there, and, unless you're not planning on taking any of your you know anything down you're better off making a plan to stay so a good plan is your best bet and if you got something like this you want to make sure that you go on Google Earth like I do and I always drive it and drop my that little yellow guy I drop him down on the roads here and there and make sure that every road that we're interchanging on uh, you got to make sure that you have Waze W-A-Z-E that is my driving map or Google Maps um, Google Earth on my laptop. I pre-plan the trip. I know the closings. I know even where the police hang out before we get there, don't I? Well, it's important. Speed traps, these, I know it all. These are 12 feet tall, and that's just in reference to um, the RV itself. But, and you may have an air conditioner that's a little bit taller over the unit. Yeah, you got to uh, know so your bridges. There's been some bad situations where people tried to go under places that were smaller then they could it'll, it'll uh, make a bad day for you. This park, for example, Brown County State Park, it has a covered bridge, but it has three entrances. So whenever you reserve a site, always read on reserveamerica.com, indiana.gov, or your, your state.gov. Uh, be sure and read the print before you hit, you know, the location where you're gonna camp. Make sure you know which which highway or roadway you're taking in to that entrance because a lot of them will have more than one entrance one uh, if it's got a covered bridge you're not going to get your rv your trailer through it so you're going to have to use another entrance into the camp here we got a covered bridge at brown county and then there's the horseman's entrance and there's which is the north entrance and then there's the west gate we have to come in through the west gate because we can't cross through that covered bridge whereas a horse trailer can so you know people with horses they know but if they're carrying a trailer with them they know that they have to have a certain height trailer or they can't get and wait they can't get through the bridge they won't let them go it's a beautiful old covered bridge and they want to keep it maintained um, three of the bridges are out coming to the state park so we had to plan our trip uh, on main highways and main roadways which work out best anyway because this thing is really hard to stop and it gets going really really fast with the weight behind it especially if it's full of water gray water or fresh water tanks are full 
because there's a lot of weight in the back and it just you can feel it when you're stopping um, and to answer someone else's question do I drive this thing yes yes I do and uh, who does most of the backing in biscuits yes. I pre-made my biscuits I saved all my ziploc baggies from the deli meats and every places that we went to get deli meats I, I, I saved what I could washed them out really really well and then pre-made my biscuits and what I do with my biscuits is I wrap them in a little bit of freezer paper or wax paper. Keep them from getting frost burn. Wrap them up. John sucked the, the life out of them. And then I just microwave them. But I do uh, freeze these first, just like I did the pancakes. Write the directions on the front, just like you do the pancakes. And then put those in there. I'm going to get these back inside the freezer because it's starting to warm up a little bit. Um, Pre-make your foods. Biscuits. Pancakes. For the number of people that you need. Uh, Pre-package your food. Get all your vegetables. Everything in here that you can. Um, and uh, and pre-weigh out your food, especially if you're dieting or you have a special like diabetes or you've got something special going on. Be sure and... and do your, your meal planning ahead of time. You can go up to two, three weeks ahead in your meal planning. Uh, these will stay frozen and stay good in your home refrigerator. I'd say maybe a week prior to you taking it out. Make sure that you always keep your generator running. And um, never let your refrigerator ever turn off for any period of time. Even if you're going to the gas station, turn on that generator. Or keep your engine running. Because you don't want your, uh, you don't want your refrigerator to ever come down. And uh, we keep ours at right just above zero. And we keep the refrigerator just right around, um, just almost at the free, just right above freezing temperatures. Mm. I'd say about 34, 35 degrees is where we keep it. I don't want to be out camping and anybody gets sick because something uh, falled out and refroze or something. John will tell you I'm very picky. Most of these videos are for my children and to help them. They're all getting trailers and stuff this year and they're all wanting to go camping. So this is really to help them. All right, we're back. Now, some of the other tips I have about packing for the RV. Make sure that you have plenty of washcloths, towels, dishcloths. She's stretching, sorry. And uh, make sure that you have plenty of dish towels on hand. Um, even though I've washed them along the way. And look how white. Look how white this zone gets this. How many times have I washed this? And I've gotten it really dirty. And I just make sure that I soak it and I wash it. And look how clean my things stay. They stay really clean. And no bleach is even needed. And I, I get so sick around bleach. And we're going to be talking more about bleach here with John in just a minute. About bleaching the water system. But I just want to show you. Keep plenty of this type of thing on hand. Because you're not always, the further off grid you go, the further away from laundry mats, none of the state parks but one so far has had a laundry mat. As we talk about the refrigerator, um, I think the number one thing when I show people uh, the RV, when people have came in or they've noticed when I've fed a, people dinner and we've had picnics together, our new neighbors, whatever, the first thing they notice is in my refrigerator I have all these with the handles on them. And that they all just fit in there perfectly and then they are each designated like this one here is designated for uh, meats for beef and um, beef, dried beef and gravy over toast or maybe meat that the dog likes um, lunch meats uh, not camping without your cheddar brats right <laughs> so um, and each one is designated it has the holes in it to, to help you know the cold get around I do not overpack each one. If I think I'm going to overpack it, I'll just kind of make sure that there's still room in here that's loose. You don't want to, you know, pack this really tight. I want to make sure the cold air gets around everything. And these holes in here, in this basket, see, that really helps. And again, the handle. Just sliding these in and out of the refrigerator, they're the perfect depth for our RV refrigerator. And I got those, by the way, at the Dollar Tree got these at the Dollar Tree. Uh, you can also find some online uh, that might be able to get like a group, like a lot, you know, LOT lot discount. So, um, so I use these. These make it excellent to take the food from my refrigerator when I grocery shop before we've left. Um, 
from my home refrigerator. I know that everything that's in these are gonna go into the RV refrigerator. And when I bring them, when we get back home, I bring all the leftovers, everything we have left, back into my home refrigerator. It's just a fast way to get it from one point A to point B, from point B back to point A. And it makes it easy, doesn't it? And then usually I'll get like a tub, like a large tub, and then just line these up in them and just carry the big tub in and out. Makes it so easy. So that's my, my number one tip, I think, that helps me the most for, for packing and unpacking the, the, the food is that in the freezer mills. Okay, so next would be um, in the cabinets. Not a lot of cabinet space in most people's fifth wheels or RVs or what have you. If you have the option of having an island in yours and all the pullouts, uh, that's awesome. Um, I have a lot of cabinetry because I'm in a holiday rambler and they're noted for their cabinets. But still, I still have to be very savvy about um, and frugal about how I store things. So I make a list of everything that John wants and I want. And then I put them again in these aerating um, tubs. They're heavy duty. They don't bend. Uh, they're, they don't have to stack. You could, if, you, if your cabinets allow stackables, you can do different sizes and stackables. Uh, these are stackable. Um, our vitamins are in one. And all the medicines that we need would be in one. And John's got his name on one. And I got my name on the other. And we have that. Um, breakfast foods would go in one. Maybe lunch little microwave meals. Uh, I like to eat a lot of sunflower seeds for snacks. And I put these on salads and everything, don't I? I'm really big on sunflower seeds. So I always bring a jar of those. So, so things like this. Uh, uh, whatever your diet is, the type of thing you want. Maybe uh, some sugary snacks for the kids when they're really, really good. <laughs> Uh, something like that. Um, your bread items, your hot dog buns, your hamburger buns, things like that. We have a bread, a tandem bread uh, box in there. And that fits in that. So add a bread box underneath your cabinets. That really helps keep your bread from getting smashed. Um, freeze half of your bread and only keep half of your bread out. Because odds are you're going to overpack. And you're just not going to need, you're not going to use it up that fast when you're out. You don't want your bread to go moldy on you before you actually get to where you're going to make hamburgers. So, um, so just some tips for me. So all of my cabinets are filled with these bins. And again, I just pull all these bins right out, put them in a bigger tub when I get home and carry them all to the kitchen. And then I put them back away into my cabinets. And all I got to do is slide them back in the cabinets. And if they're labeled, I know exactly where in the pantry where to take them. I mean, I don't want to just eat them on my trip. I want to eat them at home too. So, and dog food, any of that stuff is included. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those are my tips for that. Final uh, tip for me as far as packing food and all that goes are, well, we all know I can, right? Janie cans. So what I do this is my last traveling tip for food that I can think of offhand is all my canned goods are put into this container all right and you can see we've eaten some stuff out of here but uh, oh, look at, I found I used this packaging I found my Twizzlers <laughs> I used this packaging and that's fine you got to find a place for it and put it between there and keep those jars from rocking okay and instead of using uh, packaging, I used my Twizzlers for that. Hey, if it works. All right, so here I got uh, my pork sausage links are gone. But here's my home uh, canned pork sausage patties. We can have those in the morning, actually. We got green beans. We've got lots and lots of my home canned chili. Daddy likes my chili. Uh, let's see what else we got here. We've got my sweet cherry juice. Ooh, I'll keep that out. That sounds really good to me right now. Um, we've got my home can prize winning midnight grape juice from the steamer. Remember when I steamed all that? Uh, we have lots of green beans and chili, things like that. So, Oh, and this one. What's this one? Oh, here's some more of my blackberry syrup. 
And sometimes I bring these along because I'll meet people and we can give along, we can give gifts too. Little, we'll see you at the next camp. We'll see you and we're nice meeting you type little gifts. Uh, like the people that helped us with the tire. Mm -hmm. The engineer from Rolls Royce and his wife, they were very comforting when we had the flat tire. Um, what I should have done is I should have gave him a, a, a jar of my homemade from my own crop, blackberry syrup. But this container, I believe you got it at Menards, correct? That's the only place that we can find them. If you know another place to get them, then uh, let us know below. And then what I do, for motorhome, we actually have a banquet. And so I put this on the banquet seat. And um, and, and they've, wrote, they've ridden really well there, yes, haven't they? they? Have. And I just put a lot, almost like a half a roll of paper towel around them. But it would be a good way to store extra towels in there instead and stuff those in there and then if you need an extra towel then you've got them so it's just a matter of being clever on how to pack things and to me i need paper towel so i put the paper towel between them and then what i do is as i use these up i would use the i use the paper towel up to do you know to spritz and wipe down you know the toilet or the sinks or something so um so i have a whole half roll of extra paper towel in here if i need it so, and so far I haven't needed it. I'm getting close, but so far I haven't needed it. So, extra towels and washcloths. The Zote soap, which by the way, you can catfish with that. Little pieces, not big pieces. Your natural bug spray. And I think, uh, and your homemade, your homemade juices, steam juices. Don't forget to get yourself a steam juicer. Ways to carry out your food and take a minute out of the house. Freezer meals, freezer pancakes, freezer biscuits, a dry mixes like gravy mixes and things like that made ahead of time. Um, and uh, clothesline clothes pins, finding ways like that bag to hold your, hold your clothes. Uh, and then I store my clothes in the shower in that bag until I can get to a place where we're, I know I can get the clothesline out. And um, and so those are my tips for packing and stuff. Clothes. A lot of you have asked me about clothes. I'm going to check my battery real quick before we get there. And I'm going to take the meats back into the interior. We will be right back. And I want to thank Marisa's again for dressing me for the entire month. Um, actually, they've been dressing me for a couple months. Um, I just, I've loved their clothes. I'm wearing their uh, capri pants now. And I'm wearing this cute little top that you can get at Marisa's. So we want to thank them. And you wanted to thank Verizon. Yeah, Verizon actually provided us with a service where we can have a hotspot for the computer. Free so Wi-Fi. we've yeah. got uh, Wi-Fi now. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. And be sure and go over my channel and check out how to steam your, uh, your own fruit and vegetables. It's so better for you. You don't have to add the sugars or the, the corn syrups or anything to it. And I think we're going to open this up and have a sippy sippy. What do you think? Sounds like a good plan. Mm, I forgot I packed that. And then um, label things. See, if I had labeled the top of here without opening it, I would have known what was in there. I, I kind of overpacked because I, I never, you never know when you're going to get together with the neighbors and throw a big party or something. And I did. I had, um, I made a great big vat of um, chicken Alfredo because somebody, uh, their, their propane tank line leaked. And by the time they got there, by the time they figured it out, all their meals depended on them cooking on the propane uh, stove, and they had no propane. So they were eating raw hot dogs for dinner, which is actually very dangerous. So um, so I told them, I said, no, you can come over here and cook. And well, I think well, I think you got that fire going, and I think they ended up mm -hmm. cooking that, that second night. But, um, but, uh, but no, they... I ended up making them uh, their lunch before they left. I wanted to make sure them and the children ate, and so I made a big vat. He helped us with the tire, and so I fed them all a big lunch, and we had a nice time, didn't we? We did. And I was so glad that I brought the makings for Chicken Alfredo, because I just wasn't sure. I couldn't get any more than 10 days of freezer food in the mm -hmm. freezer anyway. So, um, plus we had two coolers. Yes. So John's going to talk to us now about a few things, about... Um, well, having a variety of coolers is a good thing. We have a, a large cooler that uh, lasts, uh, the ice lasts a longer period of time versus uh, some cheaper coolers that you can get that the ice will disappear 
overnight. So uh, when you're buying a cooler, make sure that you look at it and you see how long your ice will last. A 22 pound bag of ice is close to $5 a bag. And it takes like three bags for our big 55 uh, gallon uh, cooler to, um, to cool things off. And it's more expensive in the parks to buy your ice in the parks. Yeah, it's about a, a dollar more in the parks uh, to buy your ice. Which isn't a make or a break, but you do want to plan ahead. Why save all the money making it all yourself and everything when that extra money could be maybe shopping in Nashville? Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather, you know, maybe not go one, one night out to eat to a nice cafe or a bar or grill or something. You know? Yeah, those are important things uh, to consider. If you save money one place, you can spend it another place and uh, enjoy yourself more. Um, one thing about the tires that, uh, that we learned, uh, the, uh, you have trouble getting people to work sometimes on an RV without an exorbitant uh, amount of uh, price for that. Uh, the tires, if you have your chars change, make sure they change the valve stems. Oh yes, that was a hard lesson learned for us. So you can get all new tires on your, car, uh, on your RV or your trailer, but if they haven't changed the valve stems, the, the valve stems themselves degrade over time. And um, get a good quality valve stem, not the cheap ones, but a good quality valve stems that you won't have the issues with. A brass one, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, so our tires were fine. It was actually the valve stems that are, have been causing us problems. And even the two new tires that we have have the old valve stems. Insist when you get a change of tire on your motorhome that you get new valve stems and you get proof of it by seeing the old valve stems. That's right. But I'm a, a diesel and high compressed gas engine mechanic as well. So when I went in there, I actually went in, I got to go in the shop with them when they did the work. John sat in the side room while I went in and uh, and then I went over to Napa with them and got the parts and stuff. Well, the first time we went to Napa, but they kept saying they didn't have the parts. And we couldn't figure out why they were side by side and in the same building, but they weren't communicating with each other. So I wanted to go over there with the mechanic and ended up the mechanic just had me kind of follow him around and, and he did all the work and showed me, he took the tire off, he did the ceiling and, and the ceiling and the rings. Uh, we tested the uh, valves and it was everything that I thought it was when I took off the valve stem. Um, uh, uh, I saw that the hubcap had lost a bolt and hadn't been put on right from Franklin when we had the, the, the inside tandem tire change. And that both those valves come in uh, straight through and the other one has like a turn in it and comes around and the hubcap it came loose and had rubbed through that valve stem. Then John made the mistake of putting the fix it flat uh, liquid in it and then I couldn't get any air in it when by the time I got to it I couldn't get any air in it. And so he, we cleaned all that out and um, and uh, we checked for any of the air, we put it down in the tank, we checked for bubbles, there was nothing wrong with the tire. We didn't even need a new tire. It was a valve stem and it had rubbed through from the hubcap coming loose. Well, we weren't able to get new valve stems. So uh, the, yeah, they didn't the have trailer them still has the old valve stem. So what we planned... No, 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 no. We took them off. I took the valve stems off. The they were. They, they, yeah, I took did. the extensions off. The, the old valves are still on, yes, but they do not leak. We, the mechanic and I did test mm -hmm. them. They're not leaking and they are the expensive brass ones. So if you get them, get the expensive brass ones. But there was still a little bit of rust between the wheel uh, housing and the um, and the valve stem. And so it will be just a matter of time before those will start uh, leaking as well. We got very lucky and they were showing no leaking of air. Yeah. We got very lucky. But it's just a matter of time. On a vehicle like this, when the valve stem actually goes through the wheel itself, the, the steel uh, wheel itself, make sure you have them change the valve stem when they change the tire. Big O tires didn't do it. The pe the men, the mechanic shops, mechanics in Franklin didn't do it. Um, and this gentleman was a tire repair service, and he did do it. We talked about it, and I, he agreed with me that it was the valve stem. Well, and they didn't have the, the parts available, so it may take a little bit of time to for you this. to go and get the the parts and take it with you mm -hmm. when you get your tire service. And I ended up. Um, what I was going to do is I went ahead and pre-planned because I didn't know. You have to make an appointment to get in someplace like this. And you want to go to the best mechanic that's the closest when you're on a flat tire. We got lucky and the flat tire was on a tandem. So we pumped up the tandem to the 80 degrees, to, or the 80 PSI pressure, excuse me, the 80 uh, PSI pressure. 
which is where it was supposed to be. It was low, and we couldn't figure out why a brand new tire would be low like that. It was down to 58 pounds of pressure, and it was only a week old. So we knew it, I knew it had to be a valve stem. So that's when I started taking off hubcaps and valve stems and extenders and things, trying to pump air in there. And then the engineer, the man that helped us, uh, him and John went over there and they continued to try to pump air into the upper valve stem, which goes straight through to the tandem. The other, uh, the tire, the outside tandem tire, if you know what I'm talking about, it's two tires right here behind John, side by side. There's uh, four tires on each side of our, um, of our coach. One in the front, one in the back, and then another set of tandems or double tires like you see on a semi-trailer right here in front. You know, about halfway through here, but just in front of the other single tire. And um, and that and that valve stem will have a little U-shaped extension on it. And, uh, and that's what the hubcap rubbed off. And that's what he sprayed the stuff into. So by the time I got it off and everything, we were able to get air in it. And, we, and it was holding air. You know, here we had this flat tire, and then all of a sudden it was holding air. So I knew it had to be a valve stem, but I was worried that it was a valve stem that was connected to the metal part, which I couldn't get my, even the engineer couldn't get his finger in there to fill it. He was an engineer for Rolls Royce. He could not get his finger in there to fill it either. He crawled up underneath the RV. We were all over it. And he goes, why do your new tires look like they've been sitting for a while? Why are they bulging like they've been sitting? And so we tested the rest of the tires and um and it was just the two tires that we found that had the bad valve stem extenders and then we took those off filled the tires back up and they started holding air mm -hmm. so um so i learned some things as well i mean it's like any mechanic you start learning things and that's a side of me i've never shared with any of you guys but yes i'm a diesel and high compressed gas engine mechanic as well that's a long time ago don't like talking about it but i did it so i could learn to work on antique tractors and so I used to take tractors apart and put them in parades and things uh, with my ex-husband. We That was our thing. Had a big pole barn and we had a 1948 John Deere B and a 1948 John Deere A. And um, I had the A, which is bigger than the B, and uh, and we'd race them up and down the gravel roads, which of course I'd win because I was in a bigger tractor. <laughs> it's just, it just all around bigger tires, bigger engine. But, um, but yeah, one time I went in the shop and I dropped a wrist pin by accident and... Um, my ex-husband said, I don't want you back in the shop again until you learn how to do this. So I said, fine. So he said, well, there's a course up at Purdue you can take. Because he had taken it. And he kind of laughed at me like I'd never do it. And so that's when I went and I took the course. And, of course, I did really good. I graduated fifth in my class. That's good. So I was pregnant with Jasmine at the time, actually. I had a really hard time leaning over. <laughs> but we ended up working on things like hospital generators and things like that. I wasn't prepared to, to do that. So I can actually work on our generator here as well and uh, when John pulled out the generator when the lights went out um remember you left the choke on it was running really rough and it was like choking us out I was like yeah something's wrong and I went over there and the, yeah the choke was on he left the choke on so just I flipped off the choke and it started running um sometimes you know I have to remember what I've learned too I need to find those books those are the best books from Purdue ever because you can really um go back and I mean just you can just remember it's been so many years ago but um, yes I've done a lot of different things because I love to John, tell you I love to read and learn things but I will um, tell you being a mechanic it gets you into the shop when your vehicle's being worked on because normally they keep telling you see at first they looked at me and said go wait in the office and then I looked at them and I said I'm a mechanic I'm staying right here I want to know what I did wrong I want to know what it is and John will tell you I was being very persistent and then finally they were just like, well, what kind of mechanic did you, what, what did you work on? And then I told them where to went to school. And he had me right in there in the shop. I mean, I was following him around like a puppy. You know, just, you know, they didn't have insurance on me as the problem. But, and I understand that. But I also had the insight of what I thought it was. And he couldn't figure out the problem. So, you know, he had to basically have me in there. And then we had to go to the Napa store together. And then we basically figured it out that it had to be those brass uh, valve stems that I took off because then they were holding air. And I had taken them off at the campsite. I couldn't figure out why 24 hours later when we finally got the appointment. But Progressive never showed up. That was a nightmare. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that was a nightmare. So um, that was like, what was it, nine, ten phone calls with them? Yeah. They just would not send anybody out. If we'd been on the side of the highway, we'd been screwed. Mm-hmm. Yeah.
That's scary. Yes. Be and, a bad day. and who find John's never really seen my temper with people. Never seen my temper with them. The redhead gang came out. By call number by call number eight or nine with them. Everybody in the campground knew that I was mad. I'm making these videos because it's our last day out. We head home tomorrow. And of course I've got a lot of videos, a lot of fun videos to uh, of all the parks and all the the trails and the falls. I have all those videos that I filmed to edit. And DNR. <laughs> I swear we know everybody here by now. We've been here probably a total of um, we've been in we've been in this park a total of twenty three days this this spring already. Um so um, the next subject we're going to talk about is our favorite parts of our trip, of our uh, 28 uh, state parks of Indiana. We're going to talk about our favorite parks we visited, uh, the, the Bicentennial Celebration. We're going to talk about all of that, the, our Bicentennial Celebration Tour of 2017, why we did it, and um, what it meant to us. We're going to talk about our favorite parks and our favorite parts about just one or two of the other parks and in the order that we would visit them again and uh, things we liked about some of the parks and things we think some of the parks definitely could improve upon and I'll tell you right now laundry facilities man they only one park had laundry facilities and it was not anywhere close within reach Our last, um, our last day out. There you go. Are you sad for leaving? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sad about going too, so. That back behind us there, that's the country store. Got our mind made up. We're going for a walk. We are going for a walk. She'll be tired in a minute. It was a, either a squirrel or a raccoon. All right. It is uh, 77 degrees Fahrenheit out. It's nice. It's very nice, actually. And we're going to go on the first trail that we went on at the start of our journey, and we're going to end it. Uh, with Maranatha Minutes, where we had our first Maranatha Minutes here. So we'll be, we'll be right back. Ready? Okay, we'll be right back. So what happened when the turkey crossed the road? Why did the turkey cross the road? Yeah, you get to the other side. The mulberries were better. <laughs> anyway, we're at Brown County State Park and there's a real live wild turkey. Isn't that something? Only in Brown County State Park. Okay, today is day five on our trip and we're gonna be off and have some fun here. So we will see you back here in a little while and we're right. Beautiful horses, a beautiful day, and it's the weekend and uh, all right, we're ready to go. He's just a beautiful horse. I love that one.